Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Trackman44 here. You know, you saw uh, a couple of days ago I put up a video uh, splitting wood with the old, uh, the old tractor and the homemade wood splitter. You know, but every now and then you gotta, you gotta do things to kind of recall just exactly how not so good some of the good old days really were. Uh, now, you know, everybody wax nostalgic. You know, thinking about, you know, the good old days were just great. We, we just did all kinds of cool things. Well, one of the things that we always had to do, and that was split wood by hand. Uh, we did that for years and years and years until, um, well, until that wood splitter right there came along. But at any rate, and that was in the late 70s or thereabouts, about 77 or 78. What I'm doing today is we've got a, a variety of wood here that comes off of the sawmill. We've got sawmill slabs that were too thin to make another board, but uh, they're too thick and a little bit too large just to throw right into the woodshed. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, by hand, bust up some of these sawmill slabs and then some of the fair-sized pole wood that's just not worth the effort of putting through the splitter you know just to kind of reminisce and and call back or recall the days whenever we did have to split by hand now we none of us guys ever did learn how to split or split to any degree with an axe at all uh, we split entirely with homemade with malls and specifically here's two of the particular malls right here both of them are homemade by my dad uh, this one here's an eight pound this here's a six pound uh, this here's what the ladies use, the six pound, but actually I got to where I kind of like it, especially for splitting uh, kitchen wood. You know, cook stoves, they take small, they take small pieces. You're much better off with a little bit bigger than kindling sized pieces in a cook stove because they had a very small firebox, about a six by six, seven by seven firebox, about 12, 13 inches long, and it was so much easier to, to get a good fire going with that smaller wood. So we'd always use these sawmill slabs here because most of it is going to be sap wood. So there's going to be a lot of nice, quick, easy burning wood around the outside edge of that slab wood and just makes a good hot fire real quick for your kitchen stove. Then once you get the bed of coals going and you get the coal uh, fire going good, then you can slide in a bigger piece, you know, about the size of your, your forearm or something like that. But we don't have cook stoves anymore, you know, but we still have mild days. And on mild days, it's kind of nice to build a fire with smaller wood. Smaller wood gets hot, poof, it's gone. Heats the house up real quick. You don't have to worry about overheating the house so much. So that's why we keep a very good mixture of various size woods going into wood going into the wood pile. Sometimes you'll see me put in pieces this big, just look way, way gargantuan compared to other pieces I put in about like this. Well, the the missus, you know, she puts wood in the fire a lot, you know, and she doesn't like those great big pieces. So even on a cold day, she'll go ahead and feed it with the smaller pieces you know, out of the wood pile. And that's okay, I understand that. Uh, it's not a problem at all. It's really actually very good. And then when it gets really, really cold, I mean, you know, then we just burn the heck out of everything. You know, it doesn't really matter. Come along with me down Nostalgia Lane and we will uh, we'll bust just a few of these things here just for the heck of it. No particular reason. I'm not trying to save gasoline, really, but just for the heck of it. Started splitting wood whenever I was just a little bitty guy. Uh, didn't really have any instruction to speak of. But I watched the old man do it, you know, uh, many, many years, you know, as I'm uh, beginning to learn myself. We typically use, until there are really some tough pieces to where we need to actually swing good and hard, we always use the small short handled mulls. If you notice, they're nice and short handled. That's because you can swing them one handed, especially this little guy here when it's into the smaller stuff and especially the drier uh, pieces of slab wood that's a lot of, uh, that's a lot of sap. You know, it's just a whole lot easier. And the reason we put this tape right here is so that you're really aware of actually where your handle is whenever you're making your swings. And then you hold it with the other hand. But if you notice, I'll hold it, you know, securely for a first couple of snaps. But whenever I'm making that cut right next to my fingers or close to my hip fingers, most of the time I'll slip my fingers off to the side of the chunk to where if I do make a miscalculation, it'll come in and it'll catch my fingers and it won't <laughs> cut into them sideways. It'll cause my fingers to deflect. That's another reason why I very seldom keep an exceptionally sharp edge on the malls. I like a nice dull edge on my malls, within reason. Don't want it as blunt as the back of my fingers, but a blunt edge, if you do accidentally hit the palm of your hand doing the way I split, it mostly just deflects it. And a lot of times I'll just wear a glove on the left hand and nothing on the right hand because it takes more of a grip to hold on to the, the maul with a swing an eight pound maul or a six pound mall, it takes more of a grip whenever you've got any kind of glove on. Um, and so I just have a much better feel and feel like I've got a better grip without the glove. So that's the where's and why's and, and what if's and all that kind of stuff. However, as I say in many, many videos, 
Do not do as I say, and definitely do not do as I do, because this is a learned technique that's taken a long time to develop to the point to where I'm confident and have been confident of the swing and of the aim and of the way I split wood. I am confident of it. I've uh, been doing it for many, many, many years. So like I said, don't do as I say and don't do as I do, or you're going to be missing a digit or two. We're going to use a six pounder for most of this. This is a little bitty, and like I say, all it's going to take is just a pop like that and it's gone. This is perfect cook wood right here for your cook stoves. Now here's a little bit of a thicker one right here. Again, my hand is over here on top, getting a nice secure. It's not flying all over the place and, and having to bend over and pick up. So I'll make another cut right there. Then I'm going to move my hand off to the side just as I get ready to swing. So I hold it and put it off to the side just like that. You gotta look quick or you'll miss it. Now when this gets thrown in the wood pile, it'll get all mixed in in the stack. It's not all going to be concentrated in one big place. It's going to be mixed all in with all the various sizes of pieces. Here's a little bit of a bigger one right here. There's a piece of pole wood. If I know I'm hitting out in the middle, just busting one in half, I don't worry about moving my, because it's got to be awful bad day, you know, for me to miss my aim by four inches. I just ain't worried about it. Another piece of pole wood with a knot. There's a lot of arguments too about whether to split on a chunk of wood on a splitting block or if you should go all the way down onto the uh, on the ground. I mean, a lot of the guys argue that you lose so much of your swing whenever you're splitting up so high that you need that force to go all the way down with the with the uh, splitting the piece of wood directly on the ground. But in my estimation, the ground, if you're splitting smaller pieces, you know, your force is able to compress that ground and make a spring underneath those smaller pieces of wood. If you're splitting that same piece of wood on a large splitting block like this right here, you've got a much larger surface on the ground, it's still going to have a tendency to spring like a billiard ball 
the far one moving wherever you hit the one on this side. But that larger area compresses that ground much less and gives you less spring so you split better on the smaller pieces. Now that's my opinion only, but if you think about it, the theory holds correct. If you hit with 50 pounds of force on something this big around, on a ground with X amount of give, it's going to spread all that force in an area this big. You hit the same amount of force on the same size pieces of wood, resting on top of a much larger wood, that amount of compression dissipates much to a much larger area, of course, and the result is a less spring, a less spring or less bounce to the piece of wood, and your mall is going to want to go through it. Just think about it. So anyway, like I said, this ain't nothing but just a little walk down memory lane, you know. I don't even know why else I did it. It's just, it's not bad for you, you know, unless I cut a thumb off or a finger off or something like that. But I wasn't even close on any time. Um, and a couple of times I kept my hand there, you know, for that last pass, which was a little bit close. But uh, if you feel that when you turn loose, and this all happens rapidly in your mind, if you're in the process of making that last cut, and sometimes you feel that want to shift or move or it's going to fall over whenever you shift your hands, I just go ahead and hold on to it and go ahead and go through with it, you know, ready to, to jerk my hand away, you know, at that last instant if necessary. Uh, today it wasn't necessary. Uh, most of the time it's not necessary. But those are things that go through your mind whenever you're doing this kind of stuff. But at any rate, like I said, do not do as I say, don't do as I do. And I'm going to go back to the uh, to the wood, the big wood splitter, because I got a lot of ways to go to get this thing full before cold weather, and I got a whole pile of wood to get split here. And I sure ain't going to do it by hand, you know. Those days are long gone. But it's not bad to take a little walk down that memory lane, though, just on rare occasion. And you know what? This is Trackman 44, and I'm out of here, guys.